Hi everyone, it's Eugene Lee Show, and today I'm going to do a video on how you can use 3DF Zephyr, which is a photogrammetry package, to make 3D models from video. And that video source might be from a digital SLR camera, or it could be from just an iPhone, or any phone for that matter. So the video that we're going to be using today is this one here. So this is from a clandestine grave exercise that was done at the University of Toronto. And when you're taking video, uh, it's sort of a trade-off. Now, you can have a video camera with very high resolution and a low frame rate, so maybe 30 frames per second. Now, that's standard, although if you're moving fast, you could potentially get some blurring. And when you have blurred frames in photogrammetry, that's not great. So this particular video, it probably won't show up as well on the screen recording, but it was actually taken at high speed. This is around 120 frames a second on the iPhone. The benefit there is that you get crisp images even when you're moving around like this. Now the downside is of course that you get a smaller or image or lower resolution, but that's okay. I've got crisp images, they're smaller, and there's some things I can do in the software to uh, help maximize the, the model and resolution and that sort of thing. So let's switch back to 3DF Zephyr here. This is the main screen. You can do this fully automatically. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go through a few little steps to get to the final 3D model. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to Workflow and then New Project. So I'll start from here and I'm presented with this new Project Wizard screen. So if you wanted to do the whole model, uh, let it do everything sort of automatically, that's great. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to step you through this just sort of a few steps at a time. So I've clicked next and what I have to do now is load up some images. Now normally you would just hit a plus sign and you can import you know regular JPEG images or PNG images whatever that might be but we're dealing with video. Now there's two ways to extract frames. Well there's even more if you wanted. Uh, one is you need a program that will extract frames for you. So in this case I'm using QuickTime. If I were to go to file and export a window will come up and you see here that it says um, this is the movie file and it says movie to image sequence so for that I can go options I want to export JPEGs and this will say how many frames do I want to export per second well I can choose from a drop down or I can you know put whatever I want here so you can put three or four or five images whatever that might be so that's one way and there's other programs that will do this but QuickTime is a good one if you have it the nice part about 3DF Zephyr is that it does have a video import option. So I'm going to click on that and I'll show you what we can do here. This little window, the very first thing is the input file. So I'm just going to click on that. What have I got? Well, I've got a folder already set up and this is the movie that I'm going to be using. I'll click on that. And then I need to export these frames. So I could choose a different directory. I've got an empty directory there. So I'll just, by default, it'll just point to the same directory where the input file was located. So I'll leave that. Frame output format, you can use PNG or JPEG. A lot of people like JPEG. I'm just gonna choose PNG to be different. There may be some advantages here with uh, uh, file sizes and that sort of thing. Frames to extract, well, you could do all, but you're gonna have a whole bunch of images that you'll have to filter through. Uh, you wouldn't wanna use this, uh, especially here. I've got a 16 second video, fits at 120 frames or 60 frames, even 30 frames a second. Uh, that's uh, thousands of frames, I, I don't wanna bother with that. So what I'm gonna do is just extract four frames a second. And you wanna do multiple frames a second, depending on how quickly you're moving, you will have really good overlap, typically, if you do several frames a second. So I'm gonna stick with four, it seems to be okay, I think, and then we'll go from there. Uh, there's a feature here for uh, blurriness auto filtering, so basically it's an algorithm that goes through and checks if the images are blurred. Depending on how blurred they are, they will filter these images out. So you can shut it off if you want. I know that because this is high speed, they're pretty good, but I'll just leave it on just um, just just for the heck of it. Uh, similarity auto uh, discard threshold. So this will look at how similar the images are to one another, and then if they're too similar. You don't need you know sort of copies of the same image then it'll kick some out i'm going to still stick with every you know four frames every second and i'm not going to bother with this if you move this up too high at 100 percent, you're probably not going to get very many images at all so you don't want to do that so i'm just going to leave it shut off and i'm going to accept my four frames a second and frame queue size well this has to do with uh, memory i believe so um, i've got tons of memory on my machine i'm going to crank it all the way up it's no problem for me 
Uh, I think it's like a buffer uh, where it just writes the files to. So I'm just going to, like I said, keep it up there. Uh, hopefully it means that it'll run a bit faster. And of course, if you don't want the whole video and you want to start cropping, you can sort of choose different starting and end points in the video. But I'm going to use the entire video. Okay, so let's do that. I'm just going to go extract. Uh, I may press pause because it might take a little while. We'll see what it tells us here. Right now it's about, at about a minute. So I'm just going to press pause and then I'll come back when it's done. Okay, so we're back and it's now processed the video and I have a whole bunch of images here. So you'll see that it starts at zero and it wrote all the way to 64. So zero to 64 at 65 images and that's what I have. That's good. I'm going to just click the next button from here. If I wanted to, you know, maybe try this again, I could go back and maybe write some more frames, but I'm happy with this. This is a decent number of frames. So let's click next. Okay, this is telling me that these are all the images that it's going to use. It's an unknown camera, but it gives me the resolution here. So they're 1280 by 720. So not really high res images, but that's fine. I'm going to stick with uh, this. I'm not going to really be adding or modifying any calibration. So I'm just going to click next. All right, so this is what when we have to do sort of a, a sparse reconstruction. So there's two steps that are going on here. The first is that the software is going to go in and look at all the images and start to extract features. And then the second part is going to be it's going to match those features between the images so that it can establish the uh, camera positions for all the different photos that were taken. Now, the category here, I'm going to use close range. This is a close range project. The video camera was nice and close, very close, in fact. So we'll do that. And then on presets here, um, I'm going to try deep. So I'm going to make this go in and really look at the images in close detail. Um, you can choose something much faster if you wanted to. That's, that's fine just to get a quick result and see if it's good enough for your purposes. Default is usually pretty good, but like I said, I'm going to go deep and then see what happens. So I'm just going to click next and then I'll press pause. Uh, you'll see that it has 65 cameras and then I'm going to run here. So I'll let this go for a little bit and then I'll come back. Okay, so we're back and the process just finished. And the good news is that you'll see that all of these images here were reconstructed. So in some cases, what will happen is maybe an image or two will get kicked out because it couldn't find the correlation between uh, those images and the other photographs. But you can see up here, it says 65 out of 65 were reconstructed and I have a sparse point cloud. So I'm just going to click finish here. And now you can see I've got a sparse point cloud. And if I back out a bit, you'll also see that I've got a number of camera positions. And you can almost see the path that I walked here, sort of a, a circle, a spiral, if you want to call it that. Now, looking at the point cloud, you'll see that it's off on a really weird angle uh, relative to the ground plane. And this is something that's very common when you're using just a regular digital SLR camera or especially video because there's not a lot of information there. There's no GPS. There's nothing telling the photogrammetry software which way the coordinate system is oriented. So there are some things we can do here. One is we can reset this now and just kind of put it down. You could do this later if you wanted. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll just show this to you now. So there's an icon up here that allows you to uh, define the up vector. And looking at the point cloud, the sparse point cloud, I'm going to choose a triangle. So if I make this triangle, it's going to establish a plane. Now the direction in which you select this is important. So I'm going to go counterclockwise. Okay, like that. And once you click the three points, you'll see that the top side is up. It's actually facing up, which is which is what I wanted. Now, if I want to change that, let's say I did the opposite, you just choose it in the opposite direction. So if I go triangle, I'll go click and now I'm going clockwise. And if I zoom out here, you'll see that I actually, well, it's upside down actually. So I want to flip that back over to the other side. So uh, I can do it this way or I can go that way. But let's here, I'll do it the same way. I'll just hit triangle again and I'll go clockwise and just, just should flip it the other way around. Okay. So it looks like it's fairly level. Uh, it looks decent. And I'm just going to go okay. Now it's not oriented. Uh, in any particular fashion, you see it's kind of 45 degrees on the axis. So I could change that too if I wanted. There's a button up here that does the scale, rotate, and translate. And I'm just going to rotate. There's grips here that I can choose. So I'll choose this one here and I'll rotate it that way just to kind of square it up. I may also drop it down. So let's say, for example, I wanted the the top surface of this grave level with the grid. I can just take that and lower it down. I'm going to move back. Let's see if that's close enough for me. I think that's okay. So I'm just going to hit apply, hit okay, and we're all set up. So we have this thing 
pretty much ready to go. Now there is one more thing and that's the bounty box. So I'm going to click on this. So this is the box that was used to sort of define the volume that it was going to analyze or, or collect points on. Now I'm going to reset this because I've reset my model. But if this is too small, and if you think it's too small, you can adjust it. So I can take it, you can move it, you can rotate it around, uh, you can make it higher or lower. And you just have to click on the surface, the sides, whatever it might be, like that. Okay, and you can make it bigger. Now I often make it a little bit bigger because I want it to, you know, collect more than, you know, the area that I need. And maybe I'll get a few more extra points. If not, if you're really, you know, if you want to make it smaller, uh, for example, in this case, you know, these points out here wouldn't be reconstructed with a dense mesh or whatever it is that I'm following up on. Okay, so that's good with me. I'm just going to close that and we're going to move to the next step at this point. If I go to workflow, I'll go to the advanced and then I'll go dense point cloud generation. So we're going to click on that presented with the menu. We're going to go next. Now I've got the advanced set, but let me go back to preset. Back to close range, that's fine. And I'm going to pick off high details. Now normally this would be set to default, but I'm going to have it go in and, and really look at the high details. Uh, this is normally what I would use. But if you want to get into some of the features here, remember these are lower resolution images. So I want to ensure that I'm using the full resolution. So if these were very large images, I wouldn't want to use 100% because I've got way too many points and it'll take a really long time to process. I mean, you could, but it's not really all that necessary. In this case, I'm going to bump this up to 100% because I don't have high resolution images and I wanted to use as much of the uh, image as possible. Noise filtering, I'm going to leave that at 10% and then I've got no number of nearest cameras. I'm going to leave that at three. That's just there by default. If you wanted potentially a more accurate depth map or, or points, then you could bump that up a bit. But of course, you're not going to have as many points if you put made it too high. So I think I'm just going to leave that there and I'm going to go next and I'm going to run this particular process. Now this will also take a little bit of time. It might just take a couple of minutes. I'm not exactly sure, but I'll press pause and then I will come back once again and show you what I've got. Okay, so we're back after several minutes of processing and it looks like it has finished. So I'm going to click on this button here and now we can see the dense model that's been created. So this is the dense, uh, you can see it's got a lot of points here plenty of points and it did a pretty good job of reconstructing from the video you'd be surprised actually uh, sometimes you expect a little bit more blurring or that sort of thing but these are just the points so that's that's not bad at all I kind of like this result what we're gonna do next is we're gonna create a mesh from the points so I'm just gonna go to workflow again and I'm gonna go to the advanced tab and it says mesh extraction so we're gonna click on that we're going to be using dense point cloud one. That's what we're going to be using. And I'm going to go next. Now, again, I was on the advanced tab before. If you go to presets and again, close range and just use high details, we're going to get a lot of small little polygons or little surfaces uh, on this particular mesh. I want some high details, but again, if you want to mess around with the advanced, you can go in here. It's got some smoothness. It's got uh, water tightness. Now in this case, water tightness would be if you crank this up, then it's going to try and close the model. So if you did, for example, a statue or something where you photograph from all the way around or you took a video from all the way around and you want to close that volume, it's going to do its best to do so. And any open holes, it's going to close. I don't want to do that right now because this is an open surface. So I'm just going to leave it at 10%. I might even go a little bit lower, but uh, we'll just leave it at that for now. The max vertices here. I've got a, a million right now. That's not too bad. Actually, no, I think it's uh, 10 million. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's 10 million. That's not too bad. That's a pretty big model. Keep in mind that when you have very high polygon models, they don't perform very well in other software programs. 10 million is a pretty good size model. Depending on your computer and the type of program you're using, it may not process all that well. So we could turn this down to something like, you know, 3 million and that would still serve the purpose. It wouldn't be bad at all. So I'm just going to leave it at that. We're going to go next and I'm going to do what I did just before. I'm going to hit the run button and let it do its thing. I'm going to hit pause here and then come back and show you what the final result will be. Okay, we're back and this didn't take as long as the dense point cloud reconstruction. So I'm going to hit finish and then have a look here. So now we're looking at just the mesh. That doesn't look too bad at all. It doesn't look too bad at all. Now we can actually look at the small polygons here. We can visualize those. If I just right click and go to rendering 
and I go down here, it says, uh, oh, enable wireframe, that's what I want. Click on that, you'll see the individual uh, little surfaces that it creates, and that's not too bad at all. In fact, I think that's quite good from a visualization standpoint. Great. Well, there's still something else we need to do, and that is right now what we're doing is creating a mesh from the dense point cloud, but the mesh is pulling the colors from the actual points, and that's not all we, we want to do. We want to make a higher uh, quality mesh by using the original photographs and projecting those images onto the mesh here. So it's one more process. So we got to go to workflow. Here it says textured mesh uh, generation, uh, generation. So click on that. And I'm just going to use the default. It has all cameras. You can do select. So if you wanted to choose a subset of the images, let's say, for example, in some images, I don't know, you, you're taking the video, you caught your feed in some images or something like that, you can exclude those and then, you know, have a cleaner uh, model or whatever. But I'm just going to use this. That looks good to me. I'm going to click next. Uh, category is just general default single texture. Now, there are different ways to create the materials. So you can have a single texture, you can have multi texture, uh, or you can have uh, very high details. I'm just going to use the single texture here, but you can, if you go to presets and go to advanced, you'll see here number of textures. You can make this four. You can choose the image size, that sort of thing. I think it's going to look fine with what I've got here. So I'm just going to go next, go to the preset, just use a default single. But again, you know, depending if you really want a high, high quality model, you want to have multiple textures, high res textures. Again, just keep in mind that some programs will have a little bit of an issue when it uses that sort of thing. And I'm going to hit run here. And let's see how long this is going to take. I think I'll probably press pause again. It's not doing too bad, but just to save your time, I'm just going to hit pause. So we now have our textured mesh. I'm going to click finish. And this is what it looks like. We've got some nice colors. Actually, I still have the uh, wireframe enabled. I'm just going to undo that because it gets distracting. There we go. You can see now with the images projected properly, it looks really, really nice. Really, really nice model here. So that's pretty much it. There are a couple of other things to be done, of course, when you have a photogrammetry project like this and we don't have any uh, sort of uh, scale, we need to scale this model because right now it's not scaled. I'll save that for another video. And also the other thing we would need to do is export this model. And that we could just do from here, export, and we want to export the textured mesh. And it gives you different options to do so. Um, it's not that difficult to do. You just have to choose what you want and then kind of go from there. So that's how you would create a 3D model using 3DF Zephyr, extracting the frames, running the sparse uh, point cloud creation, creating the dense point cloud, meshing, and then texturing. And then you can export this and do some other cool things with it.